Okay, I think we'll begin. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Rob Thompson and I'm Business Development Manager at Microgem. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about DNA extraction from insects and in particular Microgem's method for doing this, which is something called temperature driven extraction. Um, so I'm going to split this up into four sections. I'm going to focus in the first section on actual temperature driven extraction, how it works, and, uh, and give you a protocol that we use to extract DNA from insects. Then in the second section, we're going to move on to how temperature driven extraction compares to traditional DNA extraction methods. And some of the advantages that come with temperature driven extraction and, and why, why in some cases it's more appropriate. Um, we'll then move on to section three and look at some actual publications of some groups using um, using the microgen method for some of their work. And then in the final section, we're going to go on to Q and A's, um, and I'll try and get through some questions. So there should be a Q and A button on your screen. I believe it's at the top of your screen. Um, so. As I go through this webinar, if you have any questions, please just write down in that Q and A section, and um, I'll try and get to them. Try and get through them at the end. I'd also just like to say that this will be recorded, this webinar. So um, if you do want to refresh your memory on this at a later date and, and review it again, then um, you can just watch this again on, on the demand. So, temperature-driven extraction. Now to understand how temperature driven extraction works. First, we're just gonna have a quick look at a traditional DNA extraction method. Um, so here is just a simplified proto process for a phenol chloroform extraction. So this is quite a kind of um, old school method, a very manual method, uh, but it, it is still used now. And, um, and even magnetic bead and column based methods, they are built off this. So understanding this is, um, is an important one. But very simply, with traditional DNA extraction methods, you generally use proteinase K. And this is a proteinase that's used to break down proteins in the cell, things like nucleases, but also to strip the, um, the proteins away from the DNA to help with the DNA extraction. So proteinase K is generally used. The problem is that by itself, Proteinase K is not very good at the, at the cell lysis side of things. It's not good at breaking those cells apart to actually get access to those proteins. So to help it, we generally add in ionic detergents, things like SDS. Okay, and this, this helps to lyse the cells and then means that proteinase K now has access to those proteins. Now, so that, that's the first step, proteinase K and SDS, the cell lysis. You will actually extract your DNA at this first step during the cell lysis. The problem is that you now have your extracted DNA mixed with SDS. And SDS inhibits your downstream process. If you're doing PCR or sequencing and you've got SDS in there, it's gonna cause interference. So what these methods do is they have these cleanup steps on the right-hand side here. Um, and this is to get the DNA in a condition where you can actually carry out your analysis. So it's to remove these, these chemicals that you add in in the first place. So with this extraction here, um, phenol chloroform, you do a phenol extraction. That would remove your proteinase K and your SDS, but now you have your DNA mixed with phenol, and that will also inhibit your downstream process. So you do a chloroform extraction. That removes your phenol, but now you're left with chloroform, which inhibits you do an ethanol precipitation and so on and so on until you get your DNA in a condition where you can actually use it. So you can see all of these steps, they all feed back to the fact that you added in that SDS in the first place. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of traditional method of phenol chloroform method. If we have a look at columns and magnetic beads, they're built on the same principle whereby the columns here, you'd add proteinase K, and SDS. You do your cell lysis and get the DNA and you would draw that, so you draw the mixture through a silica column, vacuums or centrifuge. You then do your multiple wash steps to wash away these, these chemicals. You do your elution to get your DNA and then you would use it. 
So that's a column method. Magnetic beads, very similar, except for you wouldn't use a silica column, you'd be using magnetic beads. You bind the DNA to the beads and then do your washing and elution. Okay. So this is kind of where, where we are with, uh, with traditional DNA extraction methods. Now, microgem is different because we don't use proteinase K. Instead, we use EA1. Okay, this is one of our proteins, and it's actually a thermostable proteinase that was um, isolated from a bacteria from um, Antarctica. Okay, and we use this EA1 um, enzyme for our nucleic acid extractions. Now, EA1 is different from proteinase K. Um, as I said, it, it's a thermophilic enzyme, so it's most active at 75 degrees C. Compare that to proteinase K, which is mesophilic and is most active at 55. Okay, so it works at a higher temperature. Now, this is really important because the higher the higher temperature means that EA1 doesn't need to rely on these ionic detergents to lyse the cells. EA1 can use the heat to help lyse these cells. Okay, so with EA1, it works efficiently without ionic detergents. None of the microgem temperature driven extraction methods use SDS and ionic detergents. Okay? As well as this, the heat also means that the proteins that EA1 is targeting and breaking down, these proteins are largely denatured anyway, which means that EA1 has a, has a very high activity. It breaks down a lot of proteins very quickly. Um, and also at this temperature of 75 degrees, the nucleases in the cell, which could, would otherwise be um, breaking down your, your RNA and your DNA, these nucleases will be, inact uh, will be inactive because of that high temperature. Okay, And then finally, because it's thermophilic, EA1 is denatured at 95. So different from proteinase K, it works at a higher temperature and because of that it doesn't need these additional chemicals to help. So if we look back at this method again, what we can do with EA1 is we can remove the proteinase K and SDS step and just use EA1 and heat. Now, because we're not adding in these, these harsh chemicals, the SDS at the beginning, we therefore don't need to do this right-hand side, this cleanup step, okay? Because we're not adding in those chemicals. And actually the buffer that we use with our EA1 is compatible with PCR. So you can actually run PCR in our buffer. Um, so again, we're not adding in any of those inhibitory um, chemicals at the in the first place. So all this to say, instead of this long laborious process, we can just use EA1 and heat. Okay, very straightforward. So this is what a uh, standard temperature driven extraction protocol would look like. Okay, so step one, you take a single tube. So this is really key. Okay, lots of the advantages that come with temperature driven extraction are because we use this single closed tube for our extraction. So you get a single tube, you add in the EA1 enzyme, the buffer, water, and your sample. That all gets mixed together in, in one tube. You then heat that tube on a thermal cycler. PCR machine or um, in a um, incubator, and you would heat at 75 degrees C and then 95. So 75, if you remember, that's when EA1 is most active. So at 75 degrees, EA1 is very active. The cells in your sample, they will lyse, and EA1 goes around and breaks down the nucleases and strips the DNA of protein. So you will extract your DNA at this 75 degree step. We then do a very quick 95 degree step, and this is to destroy EA1, okay? Because EA1 is a proteinase, so we'd rather not have that in the mix when working with um, things like PCR because you'd have a polymerase in there, and we, we don't want EA1 interfering with that. So we do a very quick 95 step to destroy the EA1. After you've done these two heat steps, the DNA is ready, okay? So you, you have your, your closed tube, which hasn't been opened for the entire process. That has a solution um, with DNA in it, and this is ready for your downstream um, analysis. Okay, so very, very straightforward. 
we look back at these these uh, traditional methods and now we can put in a new alternative which is temperature driven extraction you can see how much um, how much simpler that is um, compared to the other methods okay and the simplicity and the fact that it's single tube gives us um, some some key advantages over traditional methods which i will talk about a bit later so that's temperature driven extraction using a thermophilic <clears throat> enzyme heat buffer water just to extract dna without needing to use these harsh chemicals and therefore without needing to do the cleanup afterwards so what does this mean for temperature driven extraction for insects what do we do for insects well we have this kit here prep gem universal um, this kit we, we use for extracting DNA from a range of samples like um, saliva, blood, tissue, and, and insects as well. So here is a, a protocol from that kit for insect DNA extraction. So I'll, I'll just run through this. First step is you would make up your master mix of reagents. Okay, so one microliter of prep gem prep gem here is um is the ea1 enzyme i talked about five microliters of blue buffer which is the buffer we use and then 44 microliters of water so the majority is water so you've got a total volume here of 50 microliters now obviously if you're working with multiple samples you could make up x times that um, and then just pipette 50 microliters into each of your tubes um, to save you some time. So make up your master mix. Next step is you put your insect into this mix. Now this can be a whole insect or a part of an insect, like a, like a mosquito leg or something like that. Um, I'll talk a bit more about different sizes of samples later when we get to the publication section. But, um, but basically you, you take your insect and you put it into the mix. Now, for particularly large samples, you might need to do some homogenizing. Um, so you could either do this just by putting the insect in the mix and using a handheld homogenizing tool and just mashing up your sample in the reagent, or you could you could freeze your sample uh, liquid nitrogen and then grind it up into a powder and then add that to the mix. Um, so larger sample, it's, it's recommended you do homogenizing. Once you've got your sample mixed with the reagents, you close the tube, closed system, remember, and then that goes onto the, PD, uh, onto the uh, PCR machine or a thermal cycler, and we incubate at 75 degrees for 15 minutes. So that's the DNA extraction part. We then do a 95 degree step for two minutes to destroy the EA1. And then once that's done, your DNA is ready but we do recommend that after the incubation, you transfer the solution to a new tube. This is just to separate the DNA uh, away from your starting sample, okay? So you transfer that to a new tube and, uh, and you've got your, your, your DNA ready for, ready for analysis. Okay, so very, very straightforward, um, four steps. So, how does temperature driven extraction compare to a traditional extraction method? Well, firstly, um, there are five main advantages that temperature driven extraction has over traditional methods. Firstly, is um, with temperature driven extraction, you get a very high DNA recovery. It's very fast, it's simple. There's a reduced risk of contamination and it's very easy to automate. If you think about it, it's just one tube heating. So very, very easy to automate. Now let's go over each of these in a little bit more detail. So recovery, this is a, this is a very important one, especially if you're working with particularly small samples. If you are working with um, a part of an insect or you're working with uh, a rare sample, a scarce sample, and you, you don't want to lose any of your DNA, then recovery is extremely important. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do here is just look at a column-based method and temperature-driven extraction. Okay, so we've got the, pro the, uh, the process here. And if we focus in on these three sections here in red, these are all stages where you will be losing DNA 
in your extraction. Okay, so when you're drawing your solution through that column, you can be losing DNA. When you're doing your multiple wash steps, you could be washing away DNA. And when you do your final elution, maybe you're not eluting all of the DNA from that column. Okay, so again, you're you're reducing that recovery you're getting. So during these three steps, you, you're going to be losing DNA. With temperature-driven extraction, um, it's done in a closed tube. So the DNA that you extract, it, it can't go anywhere. Um, so the DNA you extract in your, in your extraction is, is going to be in your final solution. So, um, so by using temperature-driven extraction, you shouldn't be losing DNA during the extraction process. Okay, so extremely high DNA recovery. If we look at that in terms of uh, an actual example here, this was some work that was done um, up by our team in New Zealand. Um, this is looking at a single fly. So one Drosophila, so same starting material, but we looked at four different methods. We have a Kyogen method here, which is a um, DNEZ blood and tissue kit. We have a Zymo method, which is their quick DNA kit. Uh, we have PrepGem, which is the PrepGem universal kit I just talked about. So this is temperature driven extraction. And then we have PDQX. Now PDQX is MicroGem's own automated extraction instrument. I'm going to cover PDQX later when we talk more about sequencing. Uh, but for the basis of this, just, just think of these two left ones as column methods and the two right ones as temperature driven extraction. So Starting with the same amount of starting material, a single Drosophila, um, you can see that the column methods were getting less than one nanogram per microliter final concentration, whereas the temperature driven extraction methods were getting around 11 nanograms per microliter. So you can see the, the amount of DNA that's just being lost because you're doing those cleanup steps, but because you're adding in those chemicals to begin with, you've got to clean your DNA and you're, you're just throwing away um, DNA. Okay? Whereas with temperature-driven extraction, you're, you're holding onto that, you're, you're maximizing your recovery. Now, if we have a look at actually qPCR of this, um, we've got microgen on the left and chiogen on the right. Um, again, you can see with the microgen method, we've got the lower CT values. This kind of supports the, the previous page. Uh, about the um, about the recovery, um, and you can see they've got similar endpoints as well. So, so really, for for single Drosophila, um, using temperature-driven extraction is just a, just a much more efficient way of, of extracting. Right. So, what about simplicity and speed? Um, these are just a couple of screenshots that I took. Um, on the left, we've got the method I explained earlier, the, the insect method with temperature-driven extraction. And on the right, a cutting from um, the Kyogen DNEZ blood and tissue kit. This is uh, one of the pages of that. Now, with the microgen method, you've got four steps. With the Kyogen method, you've got nine steps, but arguably more like 15 steps because some of these steps have multiple actions in them, like Petting, centrifuging, incubating all in one step. So actually, if you look at it, um, in general, the microgen method has three or four times less steps than when using a, a column-based method. And it would be even more so if you're using a magnetic bead-based method. So very, very simple, right? Now, with regards to speed, um, this, this paper here, we're going to talk about a couple of papers. They're both from the same group. Um, and, and they were looking at whole insects, but they, they were not crushing the insects. They, they were just using the, the entire body. Um, and because of that, they decided to extend the extraction procedures. So what they did is they took the Kyogen method and they extended it. And they, they found that they were getting nice results with the Kyogen method when they were doing a six to eight hour extraction. Now, same group did it with the microgen method, again, using whole insects, not crushed. 
So they extended the microgen method and they were getting the results in two hours. So again, um, yeah, three to four times simpler and, and faster than, than traditional methods. Now this is evident here again, that this is, this is a, um, a, a diagram here that just has some estimated times for when working with 24 insect samples. So again, we've got the microgen column magnetic beads here. Um, you have a look at the microgen method, you've got the, the section in blue here, which is the 17 minute incubation. We then put a, uh, you obviously need to do a bit of sample prep at the beginning, kind of um, maybe homogenizing or, or putting your sample into the tube, pipetting the reagents, and then uh, the transfer step at the end. So totally, you're looking at less than 30 minutes start to finish. You compare that to the, um, the column and the magnetic bead method where you're looking at two hours plus. So again, three to four times. Now, what about contamination? Um, this can be important if you're working with, um, if you're doing pathology work. Um, for example, it, it's not just you contaminating the sample, it could be you being contaminated by the sample, um, depending on what you're working with. So um, reducing the risk of contamination is very important. And if you have a look at all of the sections which have a red arrow above them, these are all points when the tube is open, okay? Now, when you've got the tube open, you could be contaminating your sample, bacterial contamination, for example. Um, so you want to minimize the, the number of steps that, where you open the tube, okay? With microgem, um, you've got a, a couple of sections, a couple of um, steps at the beginning. For example, the sample prep, pipetting, where you, where you do have to have the tube open. And then of course the transfer step at the end. But the majority is closed tube in that incubation period. Um, with columns and magnetic beads, you can see that as well as this sample prep stage, they also have all of the cleanup steps at the end, adding in buffers, moving, um, moving mixtures to new tubes. Um, yeah, all, all of those steps, you're gonna be opening the tube again, so again, increasing that risk of contamination. So we've talked about recovery, speed, simplicity, contamination. Lastly, a, main, a big advantage here is that um, with temperature driven extraction, it's so simple, it's just heat. You can, you can kind of scale this work up to work on, on just a kind of 96 well plate. You could work on a robotic solution, as long as there is some sort of heat system, you can automate this method. So very, very straightforward. Um, and this instrument in the bottom right is the PDQX, which I will explain later. Uh, but again, you can use the instrumentation from Microgem as well to automate this process. But it's, uh, yeah, it's very, very straightforward. Okay, so we've talked a bit about um, temperature driven extraction, how it works, and some comparisons with, with um, traditional methods. Now we're gonna move on to talk about some actual publications uh, where, where groups have used temperature driven extraction to help them. Um, sorry, one second, yeah. Um, so just got a, a list here, like I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, this is just something that I, I copied off of our website. Um, we, the, we have a lot more publications than this on, on insects over the last few years. Um, and obviously th this is recording, so if you do want to go through and work your way through these, then please feel free. Um, but these are really looking at whole insects, okay, following that protocol that I talked about earlier. So looking at Drosophila, looking at uh, beetles, fig fly, mosquitoes, etc. So this is working with whole bodies. But I wanted to focus more on some more, more unusual um, publications because I really want to kind of um, give you some ideas on possible solutions that might be able to help help with problems that you're facing. So I'm going to focus on 
I'm not going to focus on these um, kind of more straightforward ones. I'm going to focus on some uh, some different ones. So firstly, I'm going to look at when you're working with a, with a part of an insect. Okay. So if you want to get DNA out of a mosquito leg, for example. Okay. So this publication here, uh, published a couple of months ago, early 2020, um, this group was looking at Anopheles venestis, um, and they wanted to look at the population structure um, in five countries in Africa, Uganda, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Um, and they wanted to yeah, look at 12 microsatellite markers distributed across all five chromosome arms. And they wanted to ask these two questions. Is there any evidence of population genetic subdivision within this collection of, of anopheles? And what is the maximum amount of differentiation observed within each selected site? Okay. Now, in order to do this, they wanted to work with one mosquito leg. So what they did is they took the temperature driven extraction method and they adapted it. Okay. Now they actually used a crep gem insect kit. Um, this is a, a previous kit that's now been, um, um, it's now been replaced with the prep gem universal kit. Um, but you'll still be able to, to do this method with the new universal kit. Basically, because they're working with one mosquito leg, they decided to reduce the amount of starting reagents. Now, this is really important because with temperature driven extraction, we do not concentrate the DNA that we extract. If you're using magnetic beads, spin columns, you will be doing some sort of concentrating. You would start with 200 microliters and you finish with 40, for example. With temperature-driven extraction, you start with 50, you end with 50. You start with 10, you end with 10. So the final concentration of your DNA is very much dependent on the amount of the volume of reagents you start with. So because they're working with such a small sample, one mosquito leg, they decided to bring the volume of reagents down so that they still have a good concentration at the end. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so, so what they did is they, instead of using 50, they used 10. So they divided everything by 10, by five, sorry. Um, 0.2 microliters prep gem, one microliter blue buffer, 8.8 .8 microliters water. They then put the mosquito leg into these reagents and used a handheld homogenizing tool to, to grind up this leg in the reagents. They then put the tube into a thermal cycler and followed the temperatures, uh, 75 degrees for 15 minutes to extract the DNA, and then 95 for five minutes. Now, I'm not entirely sure why they did a five minutes step here. Um, two minutes would be enough to, to denature the, um, the EA1. Um, so five minutes seems a little bit overkill, but that's, that's what they did. And after this incubation, they had their DNA, so they quantified it and they used five to 10 nanograms of the DNA in a 25 microliter PCR. Okay, so that's, that was their method, that's how they did it. What they found was that there was high genetic diversity. So they would find two to 19 alleles per locus, average of seven alleles, and they identified two clusters among the Anopheles finestis populations. So their kind of closing remark was that Further research on the population dynamics of the Anopheles finestis in the East and Southern Africa is essential to understand the implications of the structuring and what effect it may have on the efficient implementation of mosquito vector control strategy. Okay, so that, that's quite an interesting paper. Um, again, the, the link is here. Um, so please, please feel free to have a, have a look through that one. So we've talked a little bit about whole body part of an insect, but what about RNA? Okay, we've talked about DNA, what about RNA? So officially the prep gem universal kit is for DNA extraction, but microgem does have a, um, an RNA kit called RNA gem, which is normally used for cell culture work, bio pharma work. 
Um, but the protocol is very simple. It still follows temperature driven extraction and it can be adapted to work with insects, which is actually what this group here did. So this is a group in, in Scandinavia, um, publication a couple of years ago, and um, they were looking at uh, arboviruses. So viruses transmit, transmitted to vertebrates via arthropod vectors. So um, well-known ones are dengue and, and Zika, um, most common vector here being, being mosquitoes. So what this group decided to look at was arbovirus presence in Greenland and the Svalbard archipelago. Um, basically, there had been no reports of arboviruses in these two regions, so this group wanted to investigate that. Um, so they looked at one particular species of mosquito. You'll have to pardon my pronunciation here, but Aedes nigripes, I think. Um, this is the most widely distributed mosquito in the Arctic. Okay, so that's the one they looked at. And they, they took 11,000 samples over a four year period. Okay, so quite a, quite a comprehensive one. And they looked at these, these five uh, viruses. This is what they were looking for. So how did they do this? Well, firstly, they collected their samples in the summer months. Um, and once they collected the samples, they identified them morphologically as Aedes nigripes. Uh, once identified, they then pulled the samples together into pools um, of up to 30 mosquito bodies. And this was based on the developmental stage, the location, and the date that they were collected. Once they were pulled, they stored them, and they stored them in RNA later or a homemade solution, which was similar to RNA later. Okay. And they kept them on ice. And um, within two weeks, they had returned back to their lab and they could then freeze them at minus 80. Okay. So they, for long-term storage, they kept them at minus 80 in RNA later. And yeah, this collection was done over a four year period. Now, when it actually got to the extraction part, um, Prior to extraction, they thawed the samples, so, that, so they took these pooled samples um, to, to a fridge at four degrees, thawed them, and then they homogenized these pools in one mil of PBS buffer. Okay. Once homogenized, they then took 280 microliters of this homogenate, and this was their starting sample when moving on to the RNA extraction side of things. So what they did is they used the RNA gem kit, this is the kit I talked about by, by Microgem. Uh, again, it follows temperature driven extraction. It's still carried out in a single tube. It's just, it, it extracts RNA as well. Um, and what they did is that they had this 280 microliters of homogenate. They centrifuged this 3000 G for five minutes to pellet down the, uh, the sample and discarded the supernatant, the, the PBS. They then resuspended the pellet in the RNA gem reagents. Now you, you'll see some, some similarities here with the, um, with the insect protocol. We've got the one microliter of, of the enzyme, five microliters of blue buffer, and 44 microliters of water. So once this pellet was resuspended, they then heated the mixture for 10 minutes at 75 degrees C to extract the RNA. Now you'll notice that there's no 95 degree step on this one. Um, this is because generally we do not do a 95 degree step when working with RNA. And this is to um, try and preserve as much RNA as possible. If, uh, if you prolonged periods at 95 degrees, you're going to cause RNA to, uh, to break down. So we, we just do a 75 degree step for this. Now it's worth noting that at this point in the protocol, you will have a mixture of DNA and RNA. So it'll be total nucleic acid. Um, now, depending on what your next step is, um, depends on, on what you would do next, right? If you, if you have specific primers um, for your RNA, then you would just go forward to do an RT-QPCR with those specific primers. And but having a mixture of DNA and RNA would not be an issue. If you don't have those specific primers, and therefore the DNA extracted could interfere with your result, um, you would need to get rid of the DNA and to do that, you would use uh, DNAs 
nuclease to get rid of that DNA. Um, that DNA is, is, is supplied in the kit as well, so you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so just let you know it, it, it's a mixture of both. So that's what this team did. Um, they got their RNA from these 11,000 samples and they did RT-QPCR screening. And the results showed that actually all the specimens came back negative for the presence of arbovirus. So they didn't detect any in those, in those samples, okay? This actually supported other findings that the, that the group had done looking at tick-borne uh, arboviruses in, in the same region. Um, so they concluded that the circulation of arboviruses at the study locations is currently negligible or non-existent. And they theorized this, is, this could be down to issues with dispersal, climate, or biotic restrictions. It's very, um, there's lots of islands in these regions, so the masses of water could be, could be holding back the, uh, the spread of these viruses. Um, and their closing point was that with climate change and changes to tourism in these areas, there may be arbovirus breakouts, um, outbreaks in, in the future. Okay, so that's RNA. We, we, although the insect protocols are officially for DNA, you can adapt our RNA protocols to work with insects as well. If if you are having particular problems with RNA and you're finding that you're you're not getting the recovery you want, it's it's taking too long. You, you want that simplicity, then um, adapting one of our RNA protocols to work with your sample it would be a good thing to try. So what about sequencing? Um, in particular, sequencing in field, okay? Um, we'll talk quickly about the Cassava Virus Action Project. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Cassava is um, the staple food in Africa. Um, so 800 million people rely on cassava as their staple food. And uh, there are two main cassava viruses which are causing uh, between two and three billion dollars annually. And these are brown streak virus and mosaic virus. Okay. These viruses are often spread by the white fly, uh, Bermissia tabaki, um, which is a vector for more than 100 plant viruses worldwide. Okay. So it's, a, it's an important vector to be studying. Um, now, currently, um, Ways of detecting this virus rely on ELISA methods and PCR-based applications. The problem with this, and there are a couple of problems here, one is that these viruses mutate quite rapidly, so there are chances for false negative results here. And also, you've got to remember, this is rural Africa, so these farmers do not have access to PCR machines. They don't have access to labs that can do these tests. So they, they have to send their samples to the big city, or in some cases actually send their samples abroad to other countries to get tested. So you can imagine if there's a sample being sent from Africa to Europe, and then they get the results sent back, um, they're looking at over a month before they get a result, by which point um, this virus could have caused chaos in, in their crop. Um, so it's, it's a pretty sorry situation at the moment. Now, a better way of um, identifying this virus is quickly would be through sequencing. Um, this would kind of alleviate some of the issues with the rapidly mutating virus. Um, again, these sequences are not available to farmers, but with the arrival of, of more portable sequences like the Oxford Nanoport Minion, um, sequencing is now becoming a more viable option for, for virus detection in these regions. Um, the problem is that although the sequencing is now portable, um, although you've got the MinION, which is USB powered, um, the extraction, the DNA extraction part is not, and you can't just carry a centrifuge with you in, into a field and do a, do a DNA extraction, right? So the um, portability of the DNA extraction really is the bottleneck at the moment. So in-field DNA extraction is now the missing piece of the puzzle. Solution to that is our PDQX nucleic acid extractor. So this is something I alluded to earlier. Basically this, this instrument allows you to do 24 samples at the same time. Um, it uses temperature-driven extraction 
um, but it links this with a special extraction cartridge, which I'll talk about on the next page. Um, and basically this cartridge allows you to get the DNA you need to be able to do sequencing, um, whole genome sequencing. Um, as you can see from the size compared to this pen, it's a, it's a very small instrument and um, it's perfect for putting in a PCR hood or, or carrying around with you. I've, I've carried this on planes to various different countries. Um, so it's very easy to, to transport and with a battery option, um, very a, a good choice for, for doing in-field extraction. Right. Now the cartridge itself is quite clever. Uh, so the, the way it works is you, you load in your sample, enzyme and buffer into the tube. This sits halfway up in this sample chamber and then the whole tube is loaded into the PDQX instrument, which is basically a heat block designed to fit these cartridges. The tube will be heated to 75 degrees where the DNA will be extracted and then the temperature will ramp up higher so that the chemistry inside gets to about 85 degrees. At this temperature, this inner heat shrink tube here, the plastic inside will shrink down. It's sensitive to the heat, so it, it contracts, and that builds up pressure and means that your DNA extracted is then forced down out of the bottom of the tube um, and into a PCR collection tube at the bottom. Okay, so very, very straightforward. Big bonus here is that it goes through this purification column. Now this is an affinity matrix, so we generally use this when working with plant samples and blood when you, we want to filter out phenols and heme and things like that. Um, but what this purification column does is it filters out EA1, which means we do not need to do the heat kill step in our extraction, which means we do not need to go to the 95 degrees and that leads to the DNA remaining double-stranded. So just to clarify, when using the chemistry kits that I explained before, you will be getting single-stranded DNA. And this is because you're doing your 95 degree heat kill. That's gonna cause the DNA to unwind and you're gonna have single-stranded DNA. Now that's no problem if you're doing PCR and things like that because the first step of PCR is to make it single-stranded anyway. So that's no problem. But when you're looking at whole genome sequencing on, on a nanopore, for example, you need that double-stranded DNA. So to do that, you would use this PDQX tube to get you the double-stranded DNA needed. So what this team did, uh, the end of 2018, they went to uh, three countries, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, and they went armed with a PDQX and a battery pack. Okay, and in the field underneath a tree they were able to extract dna from the cassava leaves and from the white fly from the cassava field then they took that dna directly put it into the oxford nanopore minion and sequenced the dna and then could identify that it was cassava mosaic virus and they could identify this from the virus found on the plant, but also the virus found on its vector, this white fly. So overall, the, the team were able to identify cassava mosaic virus from the leaf and the vector in field, underneath a tree, using just batteries in less than three hours start to finish. So by the time they'd finished their trip going to these three countries, they had, they had compressed the, the um, protocol down to less than three hours start to finish. You compare that to um, over a month if you're sending the sample to another country and getting it back, it's an amazing improvement. Like um, you could have a team of scientists going to, a, going to a, a farm, within three hours you could give the farmer an answer, does their crop have this virus? Um, does, um, does this farmer need to plant some um, resistant strains of his crop, right? So, really interesting stuff and this is all possible because the bottleneck of um, DNA extraction has been alleviated by the um, PDQX and the simplicity of temperature driven extraction. So for more information on this I recommend you have a look at the Cassava Virus Action Project website, it's really interesting stuff, uh, so there's a link here. 
So we're running out of time. So to go to a summary, um, we've talked about temperature driven extraction. So Microgem's method for insect DNA extraction is an easily automatable, quick, simple, single tube approach, which results in a low risk of contamination and a high DNA recovery. DNA can be extracted from insects and also pathogens present in the sample. So ENA, EA1 will not discriminate, right? It will extract the DNA from the white fly and the virus on the white fly, for example. Chemistry only solutions are available for when high throughput and maximum recovery is needed. And the PDQX solution is also available for when double stranded DNA is required, for example, when you're looking at whole genome sequencing. And although official microgem insect protocols are for DNA extraction, protocols can and have been easily adapted to extract RNA from these insects. Okay, so I hope that's given you some insight into how microgem goes about um, extracting nucleic acids from insects and has given you some ideas for possible solutions to help out with some of the problems you might be facing. I have my, my email address at the bottom here. So if you do have any questions about the, about the talk, then please feel free to send me an email. And um, there's a lot of information on the microgenbio.com website about insects, about blood, about all the different sample types we work with. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, goodbye.